the Health Equalities Group, if I forget to say what that is as well, that actually still, Half the Mersey still exists within that as a charity, but uh, with all the changes within the National Health Service and the current changes, we felt that the Health Equalities Group actually um, described better what we do. So that's a brand, if you like, across, which includes the Heart of Mersey charity, which you talked about, Tim, and uh, includes uh, social enterprises. And frankly, it's a, a fact of modern life that civil society has to position itself in the best way in order to be able to survive, to be quite honest. And I think that's something I'll come back to. So Tim has already mentioned uh, William Henry Duncan, um, first medical officer of health. Now, Liverpool, I, I will kind of paint a little bit of a picture at this point, Liverpool was essentially second city of empire. Uh, it built its wealth very much upon tobacco, sugar, and slavery. That's, that's what its history is. Um, and a lot of wealth was concentrated in the city in the 19th century. But at the same time, within that period, in the 1830s, there was the potato famine in Ireland, and a lot of people in trying to escape absolute poverty in Ireland also came across to Liverpool. And you had the amazing health inequalities, um, even more so than, than we would have now. But the extremes of wealth amongst uh, a few people and people living in absolutely terrible, terrible accommodation. At the same time, so Duncan became the first medical officer of health in Liverpool in 1847, following, following the Sanitary Act of 1846. It's worth bearing in mind, if you, how many of you have been to Liverpool, out of curiosity? Oh, that's so nice. Excellent. Thank you. OK, well, I don't know if you know St George's Hall. For those who don't, St George's Hall looks like it should have been put in Athens, basically. This fabulous neoclassical building directly opposite Lime Street. Well, that was built about, I think it was finished about 10 years before Duncan came in. So. We've got this massive affluence. At the same time, we have the Catholic Cathedral, if you come up to Liverpool now, which was finished in, I think it was the 1970s. That was built on the site of the largest workhouse in Europe, which was also around when William Henry died. So you had this huge wealth and people wanting to really show off, frankly, their wealth and this terrible poverty. And I'll, I'll sort of come back to this, but William Henry Duncan, to my mind, to a certain extent, as well as recognising Liverpool, making first steps to thinking, well, what can we do for our population? This is outrageous, the dreadful health that people face. And the life expectancy then amongst the, the poorer people was just frighteningly low. I mean, it really was horrendous. But at the same time, we've had this history of philanthropy. So some of the real public health innovators, some of the real forward thinkers were based in Liverpool either at this time or just after. So you find people like William Rathbone, Josephine Butler, uh, Kitty Wilkinson, some qu quite big names if you like, Agnes Jones within nursing, within health. And I think it's worth bearing that in mind to where we are now to a certain extent. So there's, there's a history of philanthropy and some of the best known charities in the country originated in Liverpool. So Citizens and Vice Bureau, first one in Liverpool, NSPCC in Liverpool. So there's that history as well. Uh, I think it was the first European school for the blind in Liverpool. All reflects that period. So I just wanted to paint that picture because I want to start from this, but I will almost come back to it at the end. I don't know when that's taken, but it's actually classic sort of cheeky urchin looking Liverpool, isn't it? And Tim did kindly mention Heart Emerging. You're not going to be able to read this. Um, we kind of wanted to make a splash, so I was actually employed to set up Heart of Mersey as a population-based cardiovascular disease prevention programme. That was long as well, in 2003. Now, you can't quite see this. Obviously, this is the liver bird. This is the, what, what, that's the original Royal Hospital, which is being rebuilt at the moment. And um, we wanted to get attention, not particularly from the public. This was about trying to persuade people to give us money. Things haven't really changed, you know. So we needed to make impact. So this says smoke, eat crap. Don't exercise, it's enough to give you a heart attack. Nothing's really changed, has it? That, that was in, when we had enough money to put billboards out, and that, that, was the, that was the appropriate language of the time. I think it's the appropriate language of the time now. So let's fast forward a little bit, and the next three or four slides, I need to credit a colleague, David Taylor Robinson at the University of Liverpool, and the Due North report that came out, um, I think actually it was at the end of last year, I think. Um, you know this you know there's, there's a health divide and life expectancy between the north and the south with the lowest number of years in the north. I mean, it's, it's a stereotype, but there's, there's an awful lot of truth in that. I think actually probably what's more important is um, 
the later years in life and I sort of tell an anecdote quite frequently that I was doing some qualitative research with um, Everton season ticket holders actually in when I did my master's in public health which is not that long ago uh, I thoroughly enjoyed doing it at University of Liverpool and my my uh, my um, dissertation which I finally got published today um, was looking at um, football fans and food actually it linked very closely with, with the work we were doing at the time about healthy stadia but and still do, in fact, about Healthy Stadium. The interesting thing for me is I was interviewing people or running focus groups, facilitating focus groups, shall I say, of men my age. So I was doing this, I was in my 50s, predominantly white men from Liverpool, and their view towards life and their health was quite disturbing. They just assumed by the time you hit your mid-50s, you should have all sorts of problems in your life, that you'd be on all kinds of medication. They were less concerned about their health, they'd already thought they'd kind of blown it, but they were concerned about their grandchildren's health. And here's me listening to this thinking, well, I, I actually want to have a bit of quality in my life for another 20, 30 years. I cycle all the time. I can do that. What's, what's the problem here? So men are my own age, and I thought that, that, that view is, is, is a real concern. So it's actually not so much always the life expectancy, which has gone up across everybody. It's the quality of your life in your later years. And I think that's a really important distinction, and we still very much suffer from that. And this is, a, this is our, uh, not my, not my uh, diagram, I, uh, David Taylor Robinson did this, but you need to know your Merseyside to, to, do it, to know it really well. But again, you can see the difference. You've, you've seen the London tube map, I'm sure. This is, this is the, the Mersey Rail equivalent on the northern line as you go up on life expectancy. So you're starting off at, say, Bootle, which is at North Liverpool. It's actually within Sefton area, is, is at the lowest. And then you come up to Leafy, Southport, basically, to places like Ainsdale. And again, that really dramatic difference. And where do we start from? We talked about William Henry Duncan and proportion of children in, in poverty. Um, those are the figures from the government access 31st of March now. Tim might be able to define uh, what, what, what uh, determines uh, the definition of a child in poverty. I'm just using government figures. But again, this difference between North East and the North West at 22 and 20. I mean, that's, that's awful, isn't it? That's just frightening in 21st century. But the comparison there with the South East and the South West, again, is, is quite dramatic. So, I want to spend a bit of time talking about two particular initiatives. I know this is a Food Thinkers event, so I'm not going to spend all my time talking about tobacco, but it's, it's really, I think, relevant to discussion and as we try and have an impact upon the food system in one form or another for myself who's worked in public health 30 years I've spent my time working in tobacco control as much as I have around food and I think the, compar the comparisons are very very interesting and it's questions you might want to think of at the end but to again to paint a picture um, back in 2003, Smoke Free Liverpool was established to, as it says here, to try and make Liverpool a smoke free city. Now, in 2008, we were rather proud. We were a European cattle of culture, uh, and we recognised that, that that presented an awful lot of problems. Uh, a lot of problems? Uh, a lot of wonderful opportunities, possibly one or two problems as well. Actually, I have to say that as you lived in Liverpool in 2008, how wonderful it was. So, hey, there's no negativity on that. It was absolutely fabulous. Um, but yes, we wanted to see what would be the opportunities for health. Now, for those of you that don't know tobacco control as well, and I know there's probably some people here who may not be from the UK as well, I mean, our smoke-free policy now in this country is some of the best in the world, without any question. Back in 2003, of course, we didn't have smoke-free legislation. And the health inequalities that I've talked about before are very, very stark when you, when you look at smoking. I haven't put slides in on this, but even in the city now, you will find areas with 25, 30, 35% of people smoke, even with smoke-free legislation in place. And that, again, has an incredibly disproportionate effect because the people who smoke most are the people on the lowest incomes and the least, edu least um, successful education background. I don't think I put that very well, but you, you, you know what I mean. Um, so, again, in terms of if you're addressing health inequalities, it's something that's very important. So, in Liverpool, we wanted legislation nationally, and we felt that, are we going to get it? Um, 
I'm trying desperately to think about my politics and the governments at the time and where we were. And I'm, I've, I've suddenly gone into, I can't remember who was, who was in power in 2003? It was the Tories, wasn't it? Shaking his head. Was it Labour? Isn't that terrible? Yes, of course it was. And I know because I get to a slide in a minute about that. The whole point, actually, and quite an important point about the way that we take, took this forward, it is relevant to the discussion, by the way, because as you talk about philosophy towards how much the state has a role to play, then you do have a discussion in terms of the politics of the, of the government in power at the time. But actually, what was very important, what was very relevant to this, actually, in Liverpool, then we had a Liberal Democrat um, uh, uh, council. Um, and it was incredibly important that the work we did actually was across political boundaries. It had to be like that. If you side in one or the other, you're, you're not going to get anywhere if you're talking about local issues and local politics. It has to be political party free, in my view. And that's something that you might want to come back to as well. But rather than wait for national policy, which is what we all wanted, what we actually did in Liverpool, and I say we, uh, I don't think I've got a slide in talking about all the different partnerships, but you're talking about a number of organisations working together from the public sector and the third sector, and I think that partnership is absolutely key as well. Predominantly public and uh, public sector and third sector though. We collectively, with the leadership of Director of Public Health, very much at the time, who of course then was in, was in the health service, pursued a local act of parliament to make all enclosed workplaces smoke free. That cost quite a lot of money to take the legal advice to actually do that. And it's something, again, we, want to, we might want to come back to later when we're talking about food. Because how much power does local government actually have to, to make those kind of changes? And in order to actually take a serious step towards a local act of parliament, uh, had to take a lot of financial, specialist financial advice that costs a lot of money, frankly. And this is why, of course, it was the, the Labour Party in power then, because John Reid was the, was the health minister at the time. Um, I'm very involved at the moment in the discussions around a duty on sugary drinks. And some of the comments here that John Reid said about cigarettes are exactly the same as now being said about sugary drinks and regre so-called regressive taxes. It's, it's the same kind of language. When John Reid came out with that, I think, I think he smoked them, but I think he, he did give up afterwards, I'm trying to remember. Um, let poor smoke, says Health Secretary. Um, he actually was pretty much shouted down by a lot of people with this comment, actually, because it is a remarkably patronising comment. Of course, though, there is also, though, the quite right issue is that we cannot preach to people, and I guess that's what he's touching on as well. But if the only enjoyment, as John Reid says, is sometimes they have a cigarette, that's not a terribly positive view of life. And it's also given that the illness and the sickness attached to smoking and the cost to individuals, uh, it's perhaps not his best comment. So some of the tactics that we used as an organisation then was to basically target and lobby. So as a third sector organisation, we had money to do that then, which is something we might come back to. We put up billboards like this around, around smoking, around tobacco and around chemicals within tobacco. We had a mobile version of this and as we tried to persuade the council to adopt a motion to, to have a Merseyside bill in terms of smoking, I mean, it does sound fairly far-reaching now, doesn't it, the idea of having Merseyside by itself completely smoke-free, but that's what we were going for, and we believe we could have done it. We actually took it to each council. So, in fact, our role as Heart of Mersey was more or less smoke-free Liverpool. had got Liverpool sorted out. We needed to look at all the other areas of Merseyside. So we have Sefton Council, we have Wirral Council, we have Nosley Council, we have Holton Council. Basically, we put this billboard on a, on a, um, on a mobile... Uh, a mobile vehicle and parked it outside council meetings so that councillors could see it as it went in. We, we, it was the days before the social media. How did we all do that? But we hassled them, basically, in one form or another. And we got those votes through. And we did all the petitions. That's at Lime Street Station. And, of course, you know, I'm not in any way trying to claim that us in Liverpool brought through, did everything to bring in the smoke-free legislation that was passed in... 2006 and enacted in 2007. That's, a, that's an advert by the British Heart Foundation. Again, another part of uh, civil society, another part of the third sector. But we played our part. And I think as we come, as I work my way through the different slides, 
The point I think I always want to make is that sometimes when we're trying to get change in policy, we look to government, we pressure our MPs, we try and make that case, as Action on Sugar has done today, as Tim mentioned about the, the reception there in Parliament. Our role as a civil society organisation based in Liverpool and across the North West is to make the case that unless those changes happen, the population of our health in our local communities will get worse. At the same time, we have to get the buy-in from our local communities so we can articulate those views. And that, to me, is absolutely key. And really, that's when I start talking about food. So the end result of all this, here we are. Neither of these MPs are, are there anymore, actually. But uh, Stephen Hesford, who was then we're all West, um, here he is outside Will Town Hall supporting the Merseyside Private Bill in November 2005. And here we are just um, three months later, Sean Woodward, St Helens North MP, receives a Valentine's Day card. The vote, actually, it was a free vote. It's, it's, it's interesting to remember. It's a, it was a free vote, uh, whether there should be smoke-free legislation. And it was passed on Valentine's Day 2006, which is extremely easy to remember. So, so I wanted to set that because I wanted to say we feel that we, we're very proud of what we did in Liverpool and the North West, the role that we played as an area, trying to articulate those views. And one final thing before I start to talk about um, comparing you now with food, is that when we all started saying, OK, we need this legislation in... in we, we need to have a bill in Liverpool. They're not going to do it nationally. Let's do it locally. We're, we're not going to wait. You know, we've had enough. We need to do things. In exactly the same way as William Henry Duncan in 1847 said, things need to happen. We said, you know, we're not going to wait. We're pretty feisty. I'm, you can tell from the action I'm not from Liverpool, but I can certainly represent the feistiness of the population. And what people said to us was, you'll never get people in Liverpool supporting smoke-free legislation. And people now say, you won't get people in support of a sugar tax, or you won't get people in... The change and the speed was absolutely phenomenal. Mm -hmm. I think speed of change in thinking now is much, much faster because of the media and the way social media works. Much, much faster. But we got that change, and now there's absolutely, it was respected overnight we got that legislation. And, you know, you really, even now, I mean, you just don't get people flouting it, do you? It, it was incredibly successful. So, let's move on to what we're doing around food. Things haven't changed. I had to check this one, and it depends whether you're into football. I, I remember taking this picture at the time. This is actually from 1990. This is Gary Lineker and David Platt. If you work hard and play hard, the rest will be history. That association between food and sport, it's always been there, guys. And there's Gary still wolfing down the walk with Chris many years later. Still does, as far as I'm aware. And, of course, we have another agenda. We have an agenda around food poverty, and that can be seen as a public health emergency. I think in the city of Liverpool now, I'm going to say this and probably going to regret the numbers. I, I can't quite remember whether we have five or seven food banks, but it's, 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 it's a huge issue. But as we saw with the Health Select Committee that reported on, I'm losing track of the days of the week, Monday, they used this slide, I think, in their report, as did Public Health England. The link between obesity and deprivation is extremely obvious. Um, as it goes up, the reception year on the, 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 the darker range here and the lighter range is year six. So uh, this is the 10 to 11 year olds. And look at this. And this is the least deprived and this is the most deprived. And you can see that gradient. It's becoming much more obvious. So let me tell you about the work that we're doing as Food Active. Very importantly and extremely unusually, we're jointly commissioned by the Directors of the Public Health in the North West. Um, I say that there are actually 24 local authorities in the North West and 17 commissioners. That in itself is a sign of the times, but frankly I'm incredibly proud that 17 of us, 17 Directors of Public Health actually commission us. That is incredibly hard to achieve, that collaborative. And, that, and I'm, I'm basically saying, well done Directors of Public Health. Back in 2012, when the government came out with a report on uh, obesity, a call to action, it was rather felt it was exactly the opposite by the Directors of the Public Health, that it, that it was far too vague and it needed some concrete action. And in the same way, over a period, they tried to address tobacco collectively. They felt we needed to address food in a collective way. So Food Active was launched in November 2013 
to tackle increasing levels of obesity. It's about population level interventions. It's about policy change. And those were the three things they call for. One of the things I think that is quite interesting, and I talk a little bit more about what local authorities can do, which is really interesting for me in terms of policy, in terms of addressing healthy weight, is whether you focus totally on sugar or whether you focus across healthy weight as a whole. So you'll see the third call that all these things essentially are, are things we could do at local level as well as national level. The third one particularly, obviously it says national regulatory controls, you can control a certain amount of marketing at local level as well. But the, the last one is something within the power of local uh, travel systems. Um, because I put this up and people say, What's 20 miles an hour got to do with healthy weight? Of course, I um, hope you all know that if people actually did drive a little bit slower, it's safer to walk, cycle and play. So it's a really important thing as far as I'm concerned. So back in 2014, the North West Directors of Public Health put out their Public Health Manifesto, obviously prior to the election in May of this year. And within that, all those issues there relate in one way or another to healthy weights. They call for a sugary, sugar sweetened beverage duty. They call for a ban on the marketing of foods high in fat and salt and sugar. And they wanted to introduce policies to encourage active travel. Now our response to that as Food Active, and I should have said Food Active is really the brand that we use, the identity used, we use to, to describe all the policies that are delivered by uh, my organisation, the Health Equalities Group, on behalf of the Director of Public Health. But in effect, we thought, well, what's one of the mechanisms that's worked in terms of tobacco control? And we looked at what Action on Smoking and Health had done, and we put on workshops and seminars within the North West with Directors of Public Health and local public health practitioners, uh, local politicians, if we could get them, civil society. And we said, what do you think would work? Can we do this? What should be in it? So we went through quite a long period of consultation. And this is, this is what we've come up with. And I'm really interested in your thoughts about some of these things and what's in it. This is, this is a work in progress. And at the moment, I can't remember if I put in a slide or not, we've got five or six local authorities in the North West interested in adopting this declaration. We can talk about it in some detail, but this is what it looks like at the moment. We, we want to challenge the local authorities to look at the policies they, they can actually enact which might have an impact on healthy weight, but essentially we want them to think about everything they're doing and think, what impact does that have around healthy weight? And the, there's always, I mean, this has been going, we've been developing this for over a year. I think the first council to adopt it will probably happen in January or February, is my, is my feeling. Some of the things that we're challenged with, and it is certainly a question I would pose at the end, is local authorities have no money now. So what happens when Coca-Cola comes and offers you £140,000 and says it wants to support your local leisure service? Now, I'm not saying if we had a local authority declaration in play. Th that's a real example, by the way, guys. I'm not saying that a local authority is still going to say, no, we're not going to take it. I can't, I can't force them, and neither will, their, neither will their members do that. What they will do, I hope, is say, OK, if we're being offered that, we need to have a proper discussion about it. We don't just roll over and take the money. Let's think about whether we need it. Can we do it in other ways? How it's going to be used? What impact is that going to have? on our population. I can't not put this on. <laughs> the bloody Coca-Cola. Are you allowed to swear when you, when you give talks? OK, so the Coca-Cola truck. This is a mobile billboard that travels across England. It rolls into Liverpool on Friday in the middle of our shopping centres. Um, and this is what it looks like. Uh, not really about their, you know, even if you could make an argument about, about their locale things, is it? It's, that's the standard red and white logo. And Coca-Cola will tell you that they're not promoting their products to the under 12s. Um, do you believe in Santa Claus? I mean, come on. Now, again, if we had a declaration in place, I'm not saying, right, that's it, we're not going to have Coca. At least that kind of thing will be discussed and thought about. I, you know, I don't know how well this is going to go, but... I'm aware that I work in an area 
of huge disadvantage where economic regeneration is absolutely key. So we're having proper grown-up discussions. So I've sat down in Blackpool Council, one of the most disadvantaged places you're going to find in the country, and I've sat down with their officers and we talk, including people from economic regeneration. And if you think about it, if you've been to Blackpool, it's kind of partly fuelled on sugar in the same way as Liverpool's history is about sugar. It's challenging for them, but they want to think about it. They want to consider it. They want to see if they could perhaps, one of the things they're considering is perhaps ethical policies in terms of funding they take. It's, it's, it, they're complicated discussions. They're not easy. And what can be done at local authority levels? These are some of the examples we've put on here. Actually, I'm very relieved that, that two reports have come out recently. The Public Health England report on sugar reduction which actually didn't say anything about local authorities in at all, uh, which was one of my criticisms of it. I had lots of good stuff in. I, you know, I'm delighted it came out when it came out after all the battles to get it out. But um, the Health Select Committee, which gave its report on Monday, if anybody's interested enough to look that up, that actually does have a section around local authorities, probably partly because they took evidence from the Association of Directors of Public Health. I think if you're really going to look for change nationally, you have to get that buy-in locally. So this is our as I've been talking about tobacco fuel. So this is our attempt to try and do that. And there are things that can be done. There are things that can be done. Um, despite the lack of money within local authorities, they still have a number of controls. As I actually said in Public Health England uh, report, actually, that we should have government buying standards in terms of nutrition and what's actually provided. Um, Really, we need to sort out the town planning aspect, and that did come in in Health Select Committee, and I've already made the point about funding rather a lot. And there are lots of things happening at local level, and the partnerships that we try and forge have to take in the question I got asked before, um, before we actually set up today in terms of what I saw needs to happen. I see sometimes so much that, that divorce between what's happening on the ground and what actually appears on our plate. So if you're going to have this local authority declaration, Basically, what we've looked at is some generic headlines, some of those about sponsorship, some of them about planning, but then there'll be a local element to it. It's not quite the same as a local authority declaration on tobacco control. So if we went ahead in Liverpool, I'd want to, I'd want to mention work done by Liverpool food people, for instance. So let's move on to just specifically talk about sugar, some of which I've already covered. Um, I'm sure you know all that, and it was good to hear today Alison Tedstone saying, I think, I'm not sure if I'm going to quote her totally accurately, but I think she said, and Tim, you'll probably know whether this is right or not, that we were the first country to recommend uh, no more than 5% of our energy from sugar. So that, that was quite good to hear her say that, and that's, that's a very important point that we're all working towards now. There are more that can come in here, but these are some of the things. The government will be publishing its childhood obesity strategy in early 2016. So in the same way, and I suppose remember where we were with tobacco, there was like almost a silver bullet of smoke-free legislation. I mean, now, obviously, we've got plain packaging. There are other things. But that smoke-free legislation in, in, in enclosed places was absolutely critical. There isn't quite the same bullet is there with food and that's something again you might want to explore but I'm also very interested in what can be done locally I haven't put a slide in with it um, but with our local authority declaration we are focusing on the kind of policies that might um, might work around healthy weight there are some areas now that are just looking at policies which might affect sugar specifically so Jamie Oliver's initiative is obviously relevant to that and people might have heard of sugar smart cities in in Brighton I haven't put a slide in about but it's, if you want to ask me about that, please do. It's, it's essentially trying to challenge businesses to put um, a levy, if you like, or their own local duty, whatever the wording would be, on sugary drinks and then the money to go to the Children's Health Fund and to be used for good causes, if you like. So it is, it is soda politics. And there are, I think, a lot of comparisons and I'm going to finish off, because I suspect I might be getting somewhere towards half an hour. Tim looks very relaxed. <laughs> I'll just talk a little bit about Give Out Loving Pot. I mean, I have learned a lot about, uh, from this, and it's been a lot of fun. I can't remember if I put the slides in, but again, if you're looking at sugar, so we've been tasked by the Directors of Public Health, both to look at healthy weight, but particularly to focus on sugar. And as we've been developing that campaign, the evidence has been growing about sugar. The PHE report, in terms of the evidence base, is actually very good. And we know that the biggest impact in terms... So, so young people between the ages of 11 and 18 are, are basically having about three times the levels of sugar they should be having. 
And the biggest impact, the, the biggest player in all that is sugary drinks. And in fact, in terms of the sugar that we consume across all ages, apart from the very old, sugary drinks are the biggest component. To me, it's low-hanging fruit. So I'm not in any way suggesting that if we got everybody suddenly to stop sugary, drinking sugary drinks, uh, it would solve everything in one coast. Of course it wouldn't. Life's much more complicated than that. On the other hand, it's actually quite a good target to actually focus on. So we have designed a campaign in the Northwest called Give Up Love in Pop or Gulp. And it, it, it's worked really well, actually. Um, it's a really small budget. Quite happy to talk about the budget. It's, it's really very low. It's trying to cr be creative. And I think that's what the third sector does, for what it's worth. I, I really do. I don't have to go to, I don't have to, go to um, a chief executive or a council or take it through all their comms teams or, you know, if we think it works and we've tested it out with a few people, we go with it. Uh, it's very much about strong visual images. And we develop materials now that, that can be used in different places. Um, in fact, I, if I'd had time, I'd have put another couple of slides in here. But, so we, we, rode, we run three road shows earlier this year. And I'm going to show you some images in a moment. And when we developed these images, I had the Food and Drink Federation ringing me up the day before, threatening to take me, threatening to report us to the Advertising Standards Authority. I love it. Bless them. And all the rubbish they put out sometimes. So, I, I mean, I actually had half an hour with, with dietitians telling me, you can't be saying this. You can judge yourself on some of the images we have. Um, I don't think I'm going to say what some of the other problems we have. But the other one I will say, however, is one of the, one of the big shopping centres in the North West refused to take our display because they have a commercial arrangement with Coca-Cola. And I couldn't even go to the press on that. I probably could have had the front page of the bloody Daily Mail on that, but I couldn't because it, was, it affected other relationships. But that's the reality of it, and that's the reality that we work in. So we went out, we took these, uh, we took conversation to the public. I'll show you some pictures at the moment. Since then, um, this concept has gone, people have used it in, in our area, Blackpool, Burnley, Oldham. We've had schools taking it, using the name. But also it's gone a little bit international, which I'm rather pleased about so you know I kind of like it that in the northwest we're still feisty enough that people look at what we're doing um, and, and Guernsey to so a whole whole range of places this is what our road shows look like and these I'm just going to show you two of the images um, I would recommend if you want to follow up some of the stuff particularly about give up loving pop have a look at the website um, it's got all the images on and they're free to use it wasn't a lot of money. We, we spent a lot of time trying to get this right. When we started, that looked slightly more like another product, and we thought we might get a season and desist order, uh, which is basically how it works. So you might see a resemblance to a product, but I probably deny that it was quite like that. But you can see what we're trying to do. We're trying to use the same approach that sugary drinks companies use on probably about a, a millionth of the budget or something. I actually think within food, and particularly around sugary drinks, we sometimes miss the dental dental issues um, and I actually think they can be quite powerful when you find one in four or five year olds experience toothache feelings in tooth loss that's really quite upsetting and the principal reason for that is around sugar and sugary drinks and I was I can't remember I've had a rather extreme week this week I know I was doing a piece on um, Granada reports in the Northwest on ITV talking about sugary drinks on Monday with young people at a local school. And a young man there said to me, um, his auntie, I think, was feeding a baby through a bottle with a sugary drink in it. And you're thinking, oh my God. And that still happens. That still happens. So the tooth issue is not to be underestimated. So we did get a lot of media coverage which is incredibly important to what we're trying to do. So remember, I started off talking about tobacco and how we try and did things. It's, it's the similar approach as far as I'm concerned, the sort of methods we're using. And this is very live. Um, we published some briefing sheets on energy drinks, sports drinks, and so on that were published about two weeks ago. You can go on our website. And I'm so looking forward to this. We're going to come out with an animation film on the 4th of December, so on Friday. Um, and it's called The Quick Swig, and it'll be about what happens when you, you drink a sugary drink. Now, I'm really hoping that we can get this all over the place on social media. So if you are interested, look at the Gulp Now site and look at our tweets on Friday, and please retweet. 
That's what it was like in 2006. Um, free sausage roll for every reader. Now that's culture, that's two years before. Uh, when I started with Heart of Mersey, I was trying to get the right name and the right brand as one has to do. And I was talking to people in a healthy living centre in Littleton, which is in Sefton, but North Liverpool occasionally. And they said, Robin, if you're going to have any impact, please can you do something about this? And essentially there was a primary school down the road and they'd see mums taking the two children to school, dropping the oldest one off at school and bringing the younger child back. And as they went past, they'd go past the Greggs and they'd literally buy a sausage roll to keep the child quiet. Now, I'm not in any way pretending we've managed to do that, but those are some of the, the real issues that we have, to, we have to try and address in some way. So I've got, I think, about three more slides. I'll come back to this slide, but these are some of my own questions. This is Austerity England. Will local authorities still be able to provide public health leadership? The money that went into smoke-free Liverpool, you're having a laugh, aren't you? I had a debate with a council last week as to whether they could afford to give us 1,700 quid for some work they needed doing. That's the level of finance we're talking about. <coughs> Will charities be able to advocate for healthier public policy? Well, it's not only the Food and Drink Federation that give me a, a problem. It can be the government from all sides. It, should charities be allowed to advocate? Well, of course, I believe they should. But you will now see the kind of pressure on charities. We had the Lobbying Act. If you actually look at, with it, I think it's the local government bill, there's something in there which says that local authorities should not pay organisations to advocate on their behalf. What's food active? Should we be able to do that? And I have to say, I'm sat here in London, one of the biggest charities in the country in terms of young people and kids' company, that's raised all kinds of issues in terms of governance. So I know my charities run properly and we're very open and transparent. But if we don't get that bit right, people have got a right to ask those difficult questions. Well, Tim and Martin in the room will know very well the issues around what happens if you take money in terms of the kind of research that you do. And I think there's, I can't remember the name of the organisation. You guys will probably know it's had to close down this week because of the, well, you can't say because of, but the, the organisation around, was it the Energy Group or something, which funded from Coca-Cola, has been closed down this week, which is, which is interesting. Now, this is where I started. Are we moving back to 19th century style philanthropy? Here on my own Liverpool, I had a serious conversation last week, say, in order for my organisation to survive and to, to fund the kind of work we're doing, should we be writing to all the important businesses in Liverpool to get funding? Because that's the kind of level we're now at. And I'm not very comfortable with that. I'm not very comfortable with it, all kinds of reasons. I'm not very comfortable with the concept that this kind of, I'm sorry for the words, but I can't find another way of doing it, this kind of do-gooder thing of, frankly, people on higher income thinking, let's do something for this deserving poor, and how do they define that? But we're starting to get that kind of mentality back. So back in the 19th century, we had Lord Leverhulme. Is Jamie the new, the new version of this? I've no idea. But again, Jamie's role, I think, is... Sorry, that said sugar rush, it seems to have warped somewhere there. Um, and again, that's what Jamie says. And in fact, the debate we're having now, you know, you've got to give the guy credit. He's, he's, he's played a very important role, a very genuine role in it. So, thank you. I've gone over half an hour, but I started to uh, enjoy myself and relax more as we went through. So my apologies for being a bit over the time. Um, that's my contact details, and I know this presentation will be shared. If you want to ask me anything outside of this, please do. That's my Twitter ID, and do watch out for what we're doing later on in the week. And those are the questions I put for myself. You don't have to use them, but they were of interest to me as well. So thank you for the opportunity again, Tim. Thank you. I mean, let me, let me get the ball rolling. I mean, at one level, you could say you give a very, very pessimistic, depressing account. Okay, and yet he's clearly a rather cheerful chap. He doesn't look suicide merchant. Uh, actually, what you were giving was a very positive vision, which is, it was in your sub-talk uh, that you said, Merseyside has feisty, cheekiness, experimentation, light touch, feistiness. You were talking about that all the way through. My question to you is, do you think that's what it's come to? That it's a question of good people uh, being sort of Davids to Goliath. Is that what you think the situation really is? Is it that bad? 
I am really concerned about local authority funding. So where I live in the city, the city of Liverpool is, uh, I think, after Hackney, supposed to be, uh, figures I've seen, sort of the, the second worst hit, as it were. And if we have to get our funding for our work through council tax, well, that isn't going to be very good because we have some of the poorest quality housing in terms of value or lowest value in, in terms of the country, in terms of the, the money that we get from it. Similarly, if you're going to look at business rates, that's not going to go too far either. So there is serious concern about funding. I, I when I'm, gonna, I'm answering this tangentially, and if I don't properly answer it, come back to me, Tim, because I'm, I, I, I quite agree. It, it's actually really hard not to be a bit depressed at the moment, but I do also want to be positive because there are some brilliant things do it, happening, and we are, we collectively as a public health community, becoming so creative because we absolutely have to be to, to make things happen. But that funding is, is, is a real bother. One thing that I've had this conversation with two or three people recently is that you start to see innovation from all kinds of different places. And when I was young, a long time ago, if you had a social conscience, you kind of either found yourself into the public sector or academia, I suppose. I mean, or, or, or charities for that matter. You'd find yourself in one of those places. What I'm finding in a city like Liverpool is some of the creativity that used to go into those areas is sometimes in very small private enterprises that are being set up where people can't find the work they want to do to carry out some of the ideas that they want to do within the public sector, or for that matter, the academic or civil society, and they're actually forming their own companies. And you find some real interesting, innovative work. I've worked with some fascinating companies. So those ideas are still there, and people will find ways to fund them. I think my concern with local authorities is that... And that, of course, is what government wants. Yeah, well, you're right, actually. Yes, of course you are. Yeah, yeah. You could be depressed about that as well. Local authorities <laughs> to go. It wants people to go and set up small start-up companies, paying themselves next to nothing, but getting off the welfare bill. That's a horrible... You're absolutely right. You're it's absolutely succeeding. right on that. Of course, it is, it is succeeding. I know. Well, I think there is a role for all of us to defend the role of the state, which I think we are... Not, perhaps not very effectively doing that, because you're quite right when you talked about development in those areas. But I do think that there are things that can be done, whatever income you've got, and that local government has to set a good example. I mean, whether you're talking about vending machines, whether you're talking about the sort of catering that it does, whether it's sort of the sort of events they have, the sort of money that they take from different people, those are all things I have control over as do local hospitals in terms of, all right, and I've worked around uh, catering contracts in, in hospitals, and yes, it can take about 20 years for things to turn around. But there are things that can be done, even on no money, and I think it's just, yeah, and you're quite right, that's probably government agenda as well, that we all do things on no money. But it's absolutely outrageous that you go into hospitals and you find commercial outlets with junk food at the front of the, their aisles. It's outrageous that you have, if you work in a hospital, you try and, you know, all the disputes around junior hospital doctors at the moment, you're working around the clock. What happens at two o'clock in the morning when you want somebody to eat? The only thing you've got available is a vending machine full of junk. That's outrageous. So there are things that can be done. And one of the things I was asked in the sort of soundbite thing before we started, Tim, is, is you know, w w what's, what's the big issue? For me, sometimes it's simply taking food more seriously, and it doesn't happen enough. So, OK, local authorities are being beaten up, but there are things that can be done, and I so think it's important to, find, to make those answers. Is your analysis, and this is, goes wider, all of us, is it that, the, the, if you like, the, the public health battle that ostensibly is about health, ostensibly is about class inequalities, mm. is what you've said. Yeah. is actually a fight about culture. And you glorified, uh, and I agree with you, Jamie Oliver, that he is an extraordinary champion, but his role is as a champion of culture. He's not a public health man at all. Not he's not a local authority man. He's not a state man. He runs an incredibly successful, I know it. He's a very successful businessman, uh, but he's a champion. But he's a cultural champion. So. Is public health, this is my other question to you, is public health actually now a culture fight? Well, there's certainly a fight over food culture, isn't there? I mean, there's no question at all. And I don't think public health has taken food seriously, and you will know that better than me over the years. I mean, the very fact that it's actually because we're having issues over obesity that we're starting to take food more seriously. 
I, in my view, in, 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 I mean, I've been less, less time than you, Tim, trying to promote the cause of better food, for want of a better term, of a better food culture. But it's, we're still taking a disease approach within public health. It's actually obesity that's led us to take food, and that's one of the, the problems for me. That disassociation, so you know, wh where's the link made between farming and what happens within agriculture and what we find on our plate? If you start talking about the real upstream population-based policies, you find yourself going to the common agricultural policy, which nobody considers from a health perspective. So, yeah, we are. We're talking about actually huge issues. But for me, I don't think public health has really properly addressed food. So perhaps that's why people like Jamie... But I, I did want to make the point that, to me, Jamie Oliver is almost the equivalent of some of those greats back in the 19th century. That's how they're manifesting now. Um, I'm Martin Carr from the Centre for Food Policy. Uh, Robin, thanks. Sobering but I think real. I mean, this is, we're seeing this with food projects all over the country. Funding's being withdrawn. You know, projects are in danger. But I want to go back to the bigger issue. I, I was interested in the smoking thing, because I think the smoking thing in Liverpool did shift the UK, along with what was happening actually in Ireland at the time, because they would have had a split yeah. issue with Northern Ireland as well. But using that local legislation, I can't remember what you called it, where you talked about it. There was a smoke-free Merseyside bill. Bill. Yeah. I mean, why haven't we got one of those for London, for food? Why haven't we got one for Merseyside? I mean, the future may lie in cities. I mean, city-states yeah. and city governance. Sorry. I, it's because I could... Martin, you'll have to shout at me. That's why I'm walking towards you, but That's I actually okay. can't hear you very well. City-states and city governance may be the way forward in the absence of national government. You know, do you think there's potential for that bill again to be introduced for food so we control local advertising so shops can't have you know, advertisements on the front for sugary drinks, just like we've done with tobacco, but at a local level? I mean, is it, is pub should public help... You know, to be critical, all the work you do, which, you know, I'm a huge supporter of, the gulp stuff you do, I think is amazing. But it's program-based, you know, it's pilots, it's programs. Let's go back to legislation, let's go back yeah, to yeah. changing the environment. So if, do you think the possibility exists for that legislation to be introduced city by city? I think it's a very interesting idea, and I think we need to be doing more work around it. I mean, I was disappointed, as I say, that it didn't come out in the PHE sugar reduction report. There are different programs happening at this time. I, I think including our local authority declaration, that, that needs to go through a council legal department to see what can and can't be done. I mean, the, the advertising space that... We, I mean, if you think about it, the commercial sector has more or less taken over so much outdoor space in terms of advertising. Now, some of that can be controlled. So if you go back to my billboard back in 2003, I worked with an advertising company, I knew where all their billboards were and I cited things appropriately. <coughs> that supposes, therefore, you should be able to control that. So there are certain things that I imagine you can do, but I, I, I honestly can't answer that question properly because well, I, I'm a supposed... Question, let me push you. Martin's question was uh, laws. Should you be going for laws, starting in the city basis, pushing it? Uh, and secondly, picking up the advertising. Well, actually, the Public Health England report makes it very clear. There's about three quarters of a billion pounds a year yeah, spent yeah. on advertising in Britain. Two, yeah. Wasn't it 256 million, something like that? About yeah, a yeah, third yeah. of that yeah. they thought was uh, targeted at, uh, uh, was it children or on, on sort of low yeah, The report in Scotland is saying, yeah, finally. Uh, you know, this is a big talk about low mm. hanging yeah, fruit yeah. Yeah, yeah. for public health. Martin's point is. Isn't it time to think bigger? Well, you know, playing around with small projects ain't enough anymore. Well, that was one of the asks we put in, and that was one of the things that Public Health England have absolutely said in terms of advertising. It was very interesting. I'm not probably answering your question. I'm agreeing with you on that. I don't know how much can be done at the city level. I, I genuinely don't. I think it has to be explored. Were Mars, I mean, how long did it take with, with, with tobacco? And I, certainly it's not the same. Years. Yeah, exactly. So it's not going to take, it's not the same. I know that. But I think some of that level of expertise we're still needing to learn from, to be quite honest. It was very interesting for me, I mentioned earlier about, I mean, this, this is anecdotal, and I'm talking to four young people in a school in South Liverpool, but when I was talking to them about sugary drinks, it was fascinating to hear one of them say she felt manipulated by the food companies. Mm. Now, really, that's, and of course they are, and that's exactly the way tobacco companies worked. And it's the same argument whether you're talking about packaging, 
that the main part of the advertising around food is again aimed at young people and again trying to get those preferences and actually of course you know developing those sugar tastes very young that that's the market so the biggest argument I think that we have in civil society to government is we have to address the health of our children and you can get a buy-in on that and that that's a kind of almost a a good public health approach, isn't it? Uh, because people will say, well, adults have got the choice. And of course they have the choice. I mean, we will remain having the choice. You can still go and buy a packet of cigarettes if you want to. But with young people, we, we are in a position where we can, we should be having much more controls. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous that um, academies don't have to have food standards as, as, as schools within local authority control. And that there is a very strong agenda, isn't there, of reducing what the state can and can't do. And to a certain extent, we have to have that argument. Yeah, um, so my name's Christine Haig. Um, I did the Masters in Food Policy here a few years ago. Um, Sorry, I'm really going to... I want to walk towards you and I can't, but I move Sorry. off that. Can so I you'll have to shout. I, shout I can probably hear you better off a shout, but maybe okay, both I'll will do. Shout. Yeah, um, sorry. Yeah, I did the... Um, my name's Christine Haig. I did the um, Masters in Food Policy here a few years ago and I've also worked for the Children's Food Campaign um, okay. run by Sustain. So... Um, it was, I've not been there for a few years and it's been interesting to go back to some of the issues I used to work on. Um, I guess a sort of a reflection and, and maybe a couple of questions that come out of that. One was you, you sort of raised this question about the similarities between the, the kind of fight against tobacco and then the fight against obesity. Um, and um, I guess just think, you know, a couple of differences there um, and maybe you, you could comment a little bit more on those. Obviously, the differences that generally people don't need to smoke, but they do need to eat. Um, so it's, that makes it a little bit more, more complicated. Um, and also the kind of, the, as, as Tim was saying, this is about culture. You know, food has you know, so many um, you know, cultural aspects to it, as well as um, you know, being basic nutrition and everything else. So I guess I'd be interested in your reflections on um, you know, what challenges that poses that maybe you didn't have to deal with so much in the smoke-free campaigns. Um, and then my second question was just around thinking about um, that s um, whether there might be impact, sort of unintended impacts of the the sort of policies you're looking at um, as um, as part of the the, the food work. Um, so, for example, in terms of perhaps um, restrictions on on food out or particular types of food outlets, is there a danger, for example, that you um, you impact on um, you know, SMEs, particularly from ethnic minority backgrounds, and other ways to, to kind of mitigate against some unintended consequences from those. And I mean, just as I was leaving the children's food campaign to, to go onto another policy there um, around the sugary drinks tax, there was a, a deliberate um, decision when s some of the research at the children's food campaign and at Sustain was starting to be done was that, you know, People need to eat, but they don't need to drink sugary drinks. You can always drink water, at least in theory. So focusing on taxing sugary drinks is a good place to start because it would be a less regressive tax. Um, so well, it may be regressive, it may but it's acceptable. Yes, maybe that's a better way of putting it. So there were a lot of questions there, questions and I, I realised that I should have written some of them down. So there was some of them as a comparison between tobacco and food, which I do think is interesting, and, of course, th there are differences. I think one of the key similarities is the efforts made by the food industry or the tobacco industry to prevent regulation that's that's absolutely key in the kind of tactics and the tactics we were basically subjected to um, are very very similar I think so the food companies will all say that they will they're doing these things themselves but we've seen with a responsibility deal if it's happening it's happening at absolute snail's pace. Actually, it was quite interesting today, the Food and Drink Federation said, if you're going to have regulation, we'd rather have regulation across the field than you know, people doing individual things. And that, again, was the same discussion about tobacco, for what it's worth. So there are a lot of similarities. You talked about culture, and clearly there's nothing whatsoever good about smoking culture, obviously, although some of the issues and the way cigarettes are portrayed are actually still there. So you look at films and you will still see cigarettes being promoted and that kind of image is actually still there and that's still a fight to be won. So there is something about regaining our food culture because it seems to have been, I don't know, it seems to have been expropriated for a better way of putting it, that somehow it's like 
How did Coca-Cola take over Christmas? Where did that come from? You know, it's, it's ridiculous, isn't it? But that's what they've effectively managed to do. And food companies, all the kind of advertising around it is, is around culture, it's around families, and somehow we have to win that back again. I don't have any answers to that, but somehow we have to, we have to try and win that back again, because it is about food. Food is core to our being, and we should be celebrating and enjoying it. And somehow we've been, the only way we seem to be able to do it is if we can go and buy these different products, or that's how it's presented to us. I think you had a third part, and I can't remember what it was. Oh, you talked about sustain, didn't you, in the children's food campaign and sugary drinks and low hanging fruit? I guess thinking about unintended oh, consequences. Oh, unintended consequences. Oh, well, uh, uh, BME communities and so on. Yeah, um, that's an example. I think I, I, I don't want to make too neat a comparison here, but there was the argument given by the tobacco industry if you stop, um, if you, uh, whether it's plain packaging or whatever, you know, you're going to put news agents out of business. I didn't notice that happening. I think what actually happens is whatever kind of industry are, you adapt. I mean, I, I went to a food catering event the other day. I'd been asked to speak and take part in a debate, and I sort of went into a room with all these companies that, that basically make products aimed at the school food market. And it was quite disturbing, but particularly in the drink section where... The drinks aren't, we, we, we haven't obviously, we've only just had the second recommendation, so you can still get drinks that have more sugar in than I would like to see. But what the companies there were saying to me was that, that what's the word they use? They're, they're, they're school food compliant. Oh my God, what a horrible term. So they're trying to punt their stuff at us. It's school food compliant, it makes the rules. But it also showed me that what they've done is essentially they've reformulated in a very fast time to meet the current standards and they'll be able to do it again. Now I don't want to be too dismissive. The other point I would make about... So what's the point? This is an important one. Forgive me interrupting. Yeah, no, go on. Standards I'll probably answer work. the question. Standards, standards work. Standards, standards work. work. Yeah, yeah. Is your point. B business will adapt to the standards. But we also need to look to support. So I was aware and it's been a long fight and I think things are slightly better but I talked about Liverpool Capital Culture back in 2008. Now when you started to go to... and We, we had big events we still do. The only offer, I always remember going, and I do eat meat from time to time, I try not to eat very much meat, but frankly, if I'm going to an outdoor event, I don't feel that comfortable, it's just me eating meat. And I remember going to an event in Liverpool and trying to have basically a sandwich with no meat in, and I, I couldn't get it. And I just thought, this is absurd, it's, it's, you know, it's not just about health, it's about diversity, it's about... But I also started to have those discussions about the kind of organisations that were able to bring in enough money to do the development to actually produce better food. And it's starting to happen. And some of that is about, are we looking at how we're supporting businesses to start off? Are we helping them? Are we giving them the training? Are we giving them the advice? That's something that can be done both from the academic sector, in terms of catering, can also be done in local authorities. Are we, help, are we making it easier? So I think there are other ways of addressing what you're talking about. But um, I think industry adapts, as, as Tim said, with standards and so on as well. Well, we're, we're having this meeting at the time of the Paris climate change talks. Exactly the same argument is going on there about how could business survive if it becomes low carbon. Well, the answer is it does and it will. Uh, of course, says someone. Absolutely. Mm. Uh, this is, goes back to your 19th century analogy. And yeah. I think it's... It, you're, Personally, I think you're absolutely right. Uh, we need to think more fundamentally uh, and be less sort of tiny in our thinking. We can think bigger, actually, about our thinking and say, we want business to be operating in a different way. Did you want to come in? Hi, I'm Mary Atkinson from Food Research Collaboration. You mentioned about the lack of money from local authorities. I just wondered how you envisage the future for, for your organization in that respect. And you also mentioned, you know, one of your questions is, will you be taking money from, um, from private sources? Um, so I just wondered what your thoughts were on, on the future and public That's such private. a personal political question, isn't it, Mary? <laughs> um, no, we will never take money from certain sources, but it's, it's, it's you know, we're not going to take money from sugary drinks companies in the same way as we wouldn't take money for tobacco. But it's, I, I don't know the answer. It's where you set that line in terms of what's appropriate and what isn't. Um, we, our funding base has changed dramatically. I mean, the, the bizarre thing is most of us who work in public health would have felt that public health is best placed within local authorities. 
but you couldn't make up the timing and how damaging that has turned out to be. It's the right place. I absolutely believe in it structurally. But in terms of finance, oh my God, it's even before it was able to make its case for being in local authorities, it was being hit. And it's getting worse, isn't it? So I actually really probably don't have an answer except that if, for my organisation, if we had to survive and we had to take £140,000 for Coca-Cola, I'd be walking straight away as fast as I possibly could. There are certain lines you don't go across. That's all I can probably say to that, Mary. But I am really worried, genuinely, in terms of, you know, and whether we're talking about... I hope we're talking more than pro programmes and projects. I, I take the points about that. But I do feel that we... Civil society really can do... Uh, actually, one thing I didn't say to the question before, I mean, in the same way as tobacco, so what happened in Liverpool linked very, up, very much up with national organisations like ASH, Cancer Research UK, British Heart Foundation. I showed the British Heart Foundation slide earlier. Exactly the same within food, so we work closely with Sustain. I've got a phone meeting book with Cancer Research UK this week, for instance, and we work with the Children's Food Campaign. It's absolutely critical, and those partnerships, I probably didn't stress that together, but when you haven't got any money, you've got to pull your resources and work together, so I guess that's another way of answering. Hello, I'm Robin. I'm from the Food Foundation. Um, it's exactly on that point. So we're a national third sector organisation that's regularly reaching out to both public and third sector organisations with a local scope, basically to kind of tap their expertise and experience. I find it very awkward because I'm aware that these organisations are often doing lots of work on not much resources. So what would be your kind of rules of engagement to how... What should we bring to the table when we reach out to people like you and... I don't know, did that question make sense? No. I'm not sure I'd totally but I'd need to know more about your organisation. <laughs> essentially, from where I sit, I'm very open to pretty much any discussion as long as it, it is open and transparent in that way. So, yeah. And I'm very... Ki I, mean, I, I think what's more challenging sometimes for a third sector organisation like myself is that because of the world we now live in, yeah. my time, I realise I have to put a much higher value on. And that, that's point, probably yeah. part of it because I'm desperate to share and learn from good practice. I've been brought up in that way. I'm trained in that way. I believe in it. Yeah. But I'm not sure I should be because of the time and the commitment. And that's really worrying. I think that's that worrying. I was, I, was, I was trying to ask and failed miserably in that there's nothing I'd like more than have a like, two-hour chat about someone's experiences. But what, what kind of national kind of organisation interested in national bodies, policy help contribute to a local organisation and what could we kind of reciprocate that kind of time and interest with? I'm not sure I'm going to be answering this now but the sort of thing that I would like to see organisations like Public Health England do yeah. and don't very well in my view and could do a lot better. I'm really interested in other people's views on that but I, that kind of sharing I think, it, what I've worked in the third sector for quite a long time now and it is incredibly frustrating when people reinvent the wheel and feel they have to go through all the same journey as you have. I'm still not properly answering. It sounds like the sort of conversation we perhaps should have slightly afterwards so I can get a better feel of it, which I'm quite happy to do. But I'm certainly, I think it's so important. I mean, that's what public health is about, I think. And that's what's scary the world we now live in because we constantly have to think, blimey, can we afford to share that? Yeah. You know, really, we have to look at intellectual property and think, well, look, I want to share it, because that's what I believe in, but if we don't get some money for it, we won't be here to do it. So it's, it's a challenge, coming back to your question, Mary. It's, it's the same question, isn't it, in another way? So it's, it's the question you're asking again. Yeah. You're asking again the question of what can an organisation like this do? You're turning it in a slightly different direction, saying what would it need to be an effective organisation? I don't know if you've had a chance to see it. We had one food thinker ago or two, I can't remember, Hannah Brinsden, yeah, I know talking Hannah. about um, what makes for effective public health advocacy. And it was, uh, you know, actually the issue of funding wasn't in that uh, because it's talking about the sort of the methods and the process of getting change. What you've done in your talk, and this has been a big theme, by the way, of the food research collaboration, mm -hmm. what does civil society need mm. to be more effective? Is it more evidence coming from academics? You've said, yes, it does need that. Uh, but you've also raised a much bigger question, which is the context, which mm. one doesn't have control over. Mm. But secondly, you've raised the issue of funding. You have some control over that, not a lot, but some. 
And thirdly, it makes a lot of difference what you're trying to do. Are you trying to get small change in one primary school in Sefton, or are you trying to get Sefton to be a role model for a, a parliamentary shift for the whole of Britain? That's, they're not antithetical, they're different options. And that takes you back to Duncan. It does. I Duncan was yeah. thinking very big, but it's hard for people to recognize Liverpool was this hugely important world trading city. And it was daring to think, actually, it's unacceptable to have this health inequalities. And the argument then, and I think you were sort of saying it now, but I want to check whether I got you right, are we in such a dire state of health inequalities that we need to be thinking those big radical thoughts about what would change the circumstances? It's Martin's question. Can local areas be champions of what should be a much bigger structural shift? As I understood it, that's what he was asking. Yeah, I'm gonna, do you want me to yeah, comment? Yeah, I want you to answer. <laughs> Well, for a start, in terms of what we're trying to do, we are still trying to operate at that city, local or authority level and the changes that can be done. Now, some of that could be your individual schools within that and they're all part of the same thing. Well, look but, what Jamie Oliver did with well, one school exa in English. Ex exactly. You can have quite a big impact. And I have to say that if you're promoting what you're doing to local authority officers, sometimes those... Uh, members, I should say, rather than officers, those local stories are actually part of the, yeah, the, the language, the narrative you need to use to make that change. Um, and I guess it's exactly the same way and why I keep coming back to it. I still feel that a city like Liverpool, with the health inequalities we have and the argument that we can make, can still have that part to play at national level. So, yes even in these times of cuts, even where we are now, yes, we can, and I think so that's important. So Martin's point was Liverpool as a role model. Yeah, I think, it, I think it's feasible. It doesn't, I mean, we work across the northwest, so I'm, I, I happen to live in Liverpool, so we're talking about Liverpool. But actually, I don't mind whether it's Nosley or Sefton, for that matter, flying the flag. There, there are other local authorities and there are other abilities to do things. But yes, I, I appreciate in the area where I work, Liverpool, or, I mean, we haven't gone anywhere near the... Devo Mank discussion, which would take us into a completely different field, but in the north, are you going to ask that question? Yeah, I'm not sure I'd answer it very well. It's absolutely fascinating Wait, to see what's next. happening. He's second. Is <laughs> no, I know actually, I did see your hand up, but no, he was, he was nodding when I was talking about Devo Mank. Let's take this question, Just if I may, there, Tim. I keep moving. I know. I like walking. Well, I'm walking so I can yeah. hear you. <laughs> yes, yeah, shout at me. Sorry. Hi, I'm Marion <laughs> Khan. I'm doing the MSc in food policy. Okay. Um, I am saddened in that everything I read and hear in the last couple of years, everyone's been saying education doesn't work. Education, education doesn't, doesn't work. Doesn't work. Yeah, yeah. I hear it from the, from the academics, I hear it from Public Health England, you know, everybody's saying that's not the way to go, we've done it, we've done it badly. Um, I think that's why it hasn't worked, it's been done very badly. Um, that's what I, th I believe. Um, what is interesting is I'm, he I'm here today because I saw a tweet which took me to gulp and I had to come and hear you speak. Excellent. Yes. Well, how good is so that? Well, welcome. If you haven't looked at the Gulp website, it is fantastic. All right, good, thank you. Um, what I'd like to know is, you're, you're working with kids in schools, you're, you know, you're having, doing first group, focus groups and so on. Can you see the potential for the kids to say, we want this to change? Yeah, I, no, I genuinely can, actually. I can, I, you know what, I can be much more optimistic when you're asking me about that. I'm, I'm actually a school governor and I have been for about nine years. I'm a parent governor, so I done my best to influence for that way but yes and I mean I think I don't think anybody says that education doesn't have a part to play the problem that we have sometimes in some of the arguments is you'll hear the industry particularly saying that well people just need to be more aware they'll make the changes for themselves which no, Marion's point was I'm going to shout at your microphone Marion's point was <laughs> most of the education that doesn't work in the name of health education yeah. is bad education well yes I, 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 I but what, not in what 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 <laughs> <laughs> what I'm noticing within schools and with young people is they are, well, not all of them, of course, I don't want to generalise too much, but you, you can have some pretty, I mean, I, it was very anecdotal, and it was literally sitting chatting with the four young people who did the, the TV interview the other day. I mean, it was fascinating to hear that they felt they were manipulated. Another young man in the same discussion 
was going on about how the brands were used to actually promote. It's absolutely fascinating. I do think that schools are incredibly important and the importance of food within schools, whether it's learning to cook, whether it's learning all the parts that food has to play, you know, we're not, we're not just talking about eating, we're growing the culture. Um, it has to be taken much more seriously. And we don't, it's right across the board, there is still so much that can be done. So we have our lunch hours cut and children don't, and if actually all the children wanted to eat school dinners, generally they, they actually couldn't do it. There isn't enough capacity. So there is an awful lot of interventions and there's a slide that I haven't put up because I've only just got it, but we all know this where, or in fact, no, I did show it, but I was talking about inequalities, but that gradient from when they come in at reception to when they leave at year six, it's, it's just appalling. So there's a lot that can be done. At I'm not sure if I'm answering the question, but I do see things changing and the discussions that I think we've had with Gulp, there's one school, um, an academy, ironically, in the Northwest that I sort of partly alluded to them before, like you, they just did a Google, found Gulp, and they kind of thought, oh, we like the name, and they just did their own thing, which is absolutely fabulous. So they did a give up loving No, what you should be doing is branding, owning it, and charging <laughs> them a fee, well, a license I, fee. If I could find a way of doing that, um, but anyway, they Talk went... They, to Jamie. <laughs> yes, I should do. I guess the, the other thing I'd say is, if, yeah. is there a way that you, and then I'll hand the mic over, is there any way that you could just get more head teachers to show a film like that sugar film, which... That's the sort of thing we are certainly trying to do. Well, the, the academy that I talked about, the other thing that was, was really interesting to me... That's that what killed the, the, the slavery trade, was people doing the equivalent of that, actually. Slavery trade didn't stop because people said, oh, a rational choice. No, 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 Let's I know. Let's get that. rid yeah, of yeah, slaves. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It was campaigning by people like yeah, you yeah, 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 yeah. By, that actually took it wider. And that's what Marion is calling. Yeah. Actually, Marion is giving an incredibly radical view for a deeply respectable <laughs> citizen at S. <laughs> S. S. I, I, just feel, I just feel it's about telling the children. Correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that she's saying something it. really important. Yeah, yeah. All right. Are you dealing, are you addressing taking children as the change agents? Well, that's. I think in Liverpool, actually, coming back to the tobacco example, there's been a lot of work with young people, to support young people acting as advocates. I think there's an awful lot we could do because actually the narrative around some of the sugary drinks companies and how they manipulate, whether it's the Coca-Cola Christmas truck or the use of cartoon figures, is really disturbing. And it's not properly told. So, yeah, I do agree. We actually managed to get some funding, funny enough, from Lottery to develop a PHSE resource. And part of PHSE? that is um, personal health and social... Someone, somebody will know. I can never get the word right. What was it? Social and health education. There you go. Just say it to the camera. Well, I couldn't hear, so Martin, shout. And then I... Yes, my brain's gone. Personal, personal, social and health education. So that, that, that's, that's teaching that happens within schools. There are classes within that. So we are developing resources around sugary drinks for that, which we'll be piloting in it's Liverpool. It's compulsory, I think, in primary, but not compulsory in secondary. Yes. Repeat yeah. that. It's compulsory in primary, but not in secondary. But I do think those are exactly... And again, talking to young people earlier this week, again talking about food and that's provided within schools, the needs to be engaged with the consumers obviously and that often isn't. It's, a, it's such an obvious thing to do but it often doesn't happen. And that's, that's really what important. the food industry does so brilliantly. Yeah, it of course. thinks the consumer first. We think public health and then, oh, what about the consumer? Flip it. Uh, Paul Blakely from the School Food Plan. So picking up on that point, and you may have already guessed, but <laughs> essentially do you think that local authorities will take advantage of the government's devolution agenda and does that present them with opportunity is there the will to do work with those additional powers as well as the I appreciate their resource issues but if the resources and the funds are there will that opportunity be taken up and uh, what do you see that looking like so will they tackle retailers at a national retailers at a local level will there be health incorporated as a more important component of planning applications so you can reduce fast food outlet density around schools and areas of low socioeconomic status how will it pan out no, these are good questions, aren't they? This is why I was nervous about coming in. These are, the, these are the proper questions, you're quite right, and they do raise a lot of issues. I mean, Devo Mank, if I'm quite honest, I'm sort of, I'm, we work across the North West, but if I got too involved in Devo Mank, that would take up my entire life at the moment. What I'm very conscious of is there are a lot of 
third sector organisations who are saying how important it is they're being involved because it's going to be the, you know, the big players, isn't it? It's going to be the local authorities, it's going to be the clinical, uh, the CCGs that are doing the, the big work and the big discussion. So that voice for prevention has to be that. I don't CCG, know the answer, and neither do we. Clinical commissioning groups. So they're the ones with the budget at the moment, but they're, they're, they're run by doctors, they're, they're medical models. So I don't know yet, but it's a fight we really have to have. And that point you made, I mean, an anecdote in, in my area in Liverpool, um, I wanted to object to a, 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 a new off-licence opening and I went through all the formal procedures I could do to, to, to object. I actually got, fun I got rung by the solicitors on behalf of the company on a blooming Saturday to say, well, you can't do this. You can't. I mean, you know, that's the kind of, this is ridiculous. <laughs> this is like we live in sometimes. And they said, you can't object on health grounds. And I, I knew I couldn't actually, so I'm trying to find every which way, but you're quite right. Why can't we object on health grounds? So I do think that's really important. Some of these devolution discussions are, and I suppose it's coming back to Martin's question, isn't it, is, is, is what cities can do. So Merseyside is getting closer to that situation that um, Greater Manchester is in. But it, this, this, is, this is a battle that's happening at the moment, but it's absolutely critical that we have those kind of discussions. You're nodding. Come back. We'll give you the last part. <laughs> no, I agree thoroughly. I don't find out They are being discussed, I don't want to say they're not. It's, it's going to be a battle, though. Pass it back to Martin. And we need to wrap up. They can be, but you've got to do it area by area. And what we're doing is we're reinventing the wheel. I mean, it seems to me, I've, I've got 10 no-fry zones contacting me at the moment about how to put in objections. In the absence of national legislation, yeah. Yeah. everybody's re- And you should build your own wheel. You know, what works in Waltham still won't work in Sefton, won't work in, in West London. but, but I mean, London is a disaster. We have got 20 local authorities wanting to do slightly different things. National legislation for London, at least, would solve that. I think the mayor could do it yeah. with a local government act. I actually think the potential exists. But I wanted to come back to another point, and this sort of, I mean, my and Robin talk a lot. So this is, I, I think that there's no overall structure for all this activity at a local level. Yeah. Yeah. You know, if you think about what you're doing, what other people are doing across the country, None of the public health bodies, I think, are offering a structure for that advocacy work to happen in a structured way. I know the faculty are doing, you know, talking out a lot, but Public Health in England can't, seem, can't be seen to be political at the moment. So they can't offer no, you a that. house, they can't offer you a structure like the old Health Education Council used to do, but was disbanded because it, it done exactly that. It was seen as political. Does anyone have a structure that's parallel, the Nordics? Well, the Nordic, the, the, food, the Nordic Food Policy Councils, that's country by country. You know more about that than I do. But, you know, there are models about, there's no, I mean, there's a lot of activity going on, not a lot of sharing of that activity across your point, the country. Uh, I think it's a great point. Uh, I mean, this is, we're trying to wrap it up. Is, is the key point that we need to have to be thinking in these dire times, you, these austerity times that you were painting, yeah. a deeply depressing time you were painting, okay? It's not or the best of times, then. It's <laughs> not the best of times. It can get a lot worse, yes, Robin. Half past seven, it can yeah. get a lot worse. Yeah. And it's probably likely to. Uh, in these times, I hear from Martin, we should be thinking big thoughts. What would we really need if we really wanted to tackle children being manipulated by soft drink companies. A sugar tax is one, you said it's a way in, it's an entry, yeah, yeah. but it needs to be more than that. What is, what's the big picture? And we can't answer that now. I but it is, I agree. I think I it's a great thought to end with. Uh, can, can I just make one comment? It comes back to Devo you, Mang thing, actually. The last word. Well, well, no, but I'm not answering the question. I, I, we do need well, to, we do need, we, 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 need, we do need to think bigger, but I, I think the devolution debate is, a, is an incredibly important debate, but I just throw back almost to a certain extent in coming back to the Greater Manchester issue. So we're trying to see whether this declaration would work and whether we can tie in policies where we can get local authorities to start to look at what they're doing. So I've already had sort of some preliminary discussion. Should there be a Greater Manchester one? Are we working in a different area? The problem is that, and this does come back to Duncan, the problem to a certain extent with local authorities is they have their local pride. They want to be seen to doing it. And I don't know whether that's going to work the same way. So that could be an issue with Greater Manchester. 
And it, it's been an issue in Merseyside already in terms of, OK, are we all doing things for Liverpool or is this a collective? So there are difficulties within that, but overall, from my view, sitting where I do in Liverpool, I get enormously frustrated a lot. I feel we can't do all the voice that we can have because those discussions are happening in London or they're happening in Parliament. So the more that we can, and I suppose that is where I started from all the way through, Duncan making his noise in 1847 or us making our noise now. We want to be heard. Don't just forget us because we're 200 miles north. And, you know, that, that, that to me is fascinating, isn't it, at the moment, what's happening in Scotland and Wales and what we can do in England where, where they obviously have got devolved powers. And Northern Ireland. And Northern Ireland, sorry, mine, correct.